Today, today I want to talk about countering the flat earth phenomenon. And I've published uh, several articles on this. This is June of 2017. The first article I published on the Answers in Genesis website was uh, 13 months ago, as you can see, at the end of May of 2016. I've, since then, I've written at least four other articles. can't remember how many I've written so far, but I get this new idea. I want to counter something, so I write it out there. And uh, I've actually probably uh, amassed, I've been studying this for a year and a half, I probably uh, amassed more than enough material for a very thick book. I'm probably not going to write it for a number of reasons, but uh, there's a lot of material here I can go over. So today is just going to be skimming uh, some of the things. And you, your first reaction would be, Danny, certainly, oh, you are kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I wish that I were, but over the last uh, couple of years, this has become quite a phenom. Uh, any of you, have you heard of this, been familiar with it? few of you? Okay, some of you have, have heard bits and pieces about it. I uh, actually, probably at least two years ago, I had um, uh, somebody, a couple of different occasions, probably six months apart, someone sent me a little little video about Flat Earth. I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting what they're trying to do there. But I didn't put it together. I just thought it was one person doing it. And I didn't realize it was a growing phenomenon, really snowballing. But then a year and a half ago, in February of 2016, uh, I had a uh, a couple of adults, a family, a couple of the parents, they talked to me about uh, somebody they knew, and one of their sons, who was kind of getting in. It's not that he believed it, but seemed to be kind of obsessed with trying to convince everybody else to talk about, kind of debating just for the sake of debating. And he, and he loved it because he could, he could befuddle people and get them squirming pretty fast. Right. And that was interesting. But then um, within the same week, I encountered two other uh, adults that were concerned about young people they knew who seemed to be into this. So, you know, in five, six days, I have three conversations, independent conversations of people concerned about others who are into it. Well, there must be something going on here. And I began investigating, and boy, was I surprised. It wasn't long after, I began asking our people at Answers in Genesis, are you getting questions about this? And I had, yeah, I have gotten a couple of questions. Some of our regular speakers told us. And soon after that started rising, Ken Ham came to me finally and said, I'm starting to get this question too. I contacted other creation ministries, Creation Ministries International, answers, uh, the um, uh, Institute for Creation Research, and uh, they started getting inquiries about it. And then uh, I serve on the board of the Creation Research Society. Y'all members? Okay, if you're not, you ought to be. And uh, talk to me about it. Anyway, uh, we've actually gotten some inquiries now uh, to the Creation Research Society. So all the creation ministries around the world are getting it. It's a rising uh, phenomenon. So it's worthy of looking into. And, and you may say, well, this is, this is supposed to be is a Genesis history uh, conference. And you may wonder, isn't this getting a little afoot from that? And it is. However, when, when people challenge Genesis not being history, they're challenging scripture, they're challenging creation, they're challenging the foundations, I think, of Christianity. And I think when people start questioning the flat earth, there's a certain agenda going on here as well. I'll talk about that towards the end of my presentation. But I think I can relate it there as the fact that it too is an assault upon uh, the Christian faith. And um, I, I, I want to single out a couple people who are worthy of discussion. I can talk about many people. But I'm trying to figure out, well, who started this stuff and, and why were they doing it? And the first name that comes to, to my mind is a man named Eric Dubé. Uh, he lives in Southeast Asia. He's a yoga instructor part-time, and I don't know what else he does, but he does blog and write about Flat Earth. He's written two books, both of which I've read. One is 200 Proofs That the Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. It's based upon a book written by a man named Carpenter more than 100 years ago, 100 Proofs on Why the Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. And so I think he's just trying to improve upon that, make it twice as good by having 200 rather than 100. So and the other's book is uh, called The Flat Earth Conspiracy. The first one I mentioned there is kind of short, and this one's a, little, about, what, a lot more material there, actually. It's called The Flat Earth Conspiracy, and I, you think about that. Is he tongue in cheek telegraphing something to us? I mean, if he really believes that the world is flat and, and we've been, people have conspired and convinced that it's spherical, shouldn't it be the spherical Earth conspiracy? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just wondering if he's giving a subtle hint that, hey, I'm just playing with you here. Anyway, he's kind of the primary guy, I think, who in recent years has unleashed this upon the world or re-released this on the world, because the idea, I'll talk about the history of that in just a moment here. The other person I want to pull out is Rob Skiba. Unlike uh, DeBay, he claims to be a Christian. He's out there writing quite a bit, speaking quite a bit. He's got some websites and so forth. He's written uh, some books, uh, one's Genesis and the synchronized, biblically endorsed extra-biblical texts. 
Another one's Babylon rising and the first shall be last. Uh, the final Babylon, America and the coming Antichrist. And another one here is Archon invasion, the rise, fall, and return of the Nephilim. Now, if you really look at those titles and digest them and kind of understand a little bit what's going on there, I think you'll understand that these are rather sensationalized topics. So sensational, fantastic, or sometimes I'll say fantastical. I'll have to emphasize that's kind of a word some people have made up. And um, I, think, I think Rob Skiba is just attracted to fantastic things. He just thinks these are marvelous things. And interestingly enough, um, Skiba will... will say in some of his presentations, he says, I haven't made my mind up on this. He has a, he has a, he has a website called Testing the Globe, and he in, insists that I'm just investigating this. I don't know. I'm kind of agnostic about the whole thing. And I've heard him re repeat that mantra that I'm really not convinced of this, but I'm just looking into it. But absent those couple of mentions here and there, it's kind of hard to tell that he's just checking it out because he seems to be giving a lot of arguments for a spherical Earth. I mean, for a flat Earth, and none for uh, for a spherical Earth. He doesn't refute any of the ar arguments for the flat Earth, and so I, I just find it disingenuous. If you're going to keep keep saying you're insisting you're you're neutral when you clearly are not, I don't get that. Um, I want to give you a quote here. This comes early on in the book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, by Eric DeBay. And uh, so I'd like to put this up and I'll read part of it to you. It says, "Wolves in sheep's clothing have pulled the wool over our eyes." And I can't help it, i got to stop there and chuckle because that is some sort of weird, something akin to a mixed metaphor. Wolves and sheep's clothing comes from scripture, and in pulling the wool over our eyes, <laughs> it's a mixed metaphor. It's kind of weird and odd, isn't it? So, <laughs> first time I read that, I started laughing. I thought, that's pretty funny. Now, I don't know if DeBay actually meant to be clever with that, or if he just, just stumbled into it. But anyway, it, it is funny. But anyway, wolves and sheep's clothing have pulled the wool over our eyes. For almost 500 years, the masses have been thoroughly deceived by a cosmic fairy tale of astronomical proportions. We have been taught a falsehood so gigantic and diabolical that it has blinded us from our own experience and common sense, from seeing the world and the universe as they truly are. Through pseudoscience, books, and programs, mass media and public education, universities and government propaganda, the world has been systematically brainwashed, slowly indoctrinated over centuries into the unquestioning belief of the greatest lie of all time. A multi-generational conspiracy has succeeded in the minds of the masses to pick up the fixed earth, shape it into a ball, spin it in circles, and throw it around the sun. The greatest cover-up of all time, NASA and the Freemasonry's biggest secret, is that we live, are, we are living on a plane, not a planet, that Earth is the flat, stationary center of the universe. Again, that's from the first couple of pages of Eric DeBay's book on the flat, uh, the flat Earth conspiracy. Now, I underlined a couple of things there. For almost 500 years, and I'm going to come back to that right away here, and uh, the idea is, is that everybody thought the world was flat until 500 years ago, and then through this great conspiracy, they changed uh, all of this to a spherical world. And most of us were taught growing up that everybody thought the world was flat until 500 years ago. What happened 500 years ago? Christopher Columbus, all right? And uh, that's why this is an easy sale, because most people believe this. And then he t goes down there and says, look at this again, I'll underline the second part there, the greatest cover-up of all time, NASA and Freemasonry's biggest secret so already you're delving into conspiracies here. Okay, so if you want to believe in this flat Earth, uh, then what does this entail? Well, first of all, their model is that what some of them call a snow globe Earth. You know what a snow globe is? It's a little uh, glass globe with some water in it and little little glittery stuff. And you got a winter scene on the flat on the bottom. You shake it up and the little glitter falls down like snow. All right. Um, there's no glitter and there's no water in there, but the idea is take all that out and you've got this flat earth sitting on the bottom and over top you've got this globe sitting there and I guess the stars are found in that globe and the sun and the moon and other things move around inside of it. In fact, they call this the snow globe uh, model, the snow globe earth. I'm not, I'm not making that up. They call, the, they call it that themselves. It's also a geocentric uh, model. Because, well, if the Earth is flat and the Sun's going to be this much smaller thing than the Earth above us, not the other way around, that the Earth's Sun's really big, then it has to be geocentric. And if it's flat and uh, you're inside of this globe, you can't circle the Earth like this as a satellite would. 
So there are no orbiting satellites. Never have been, never will be, can't be. So if we, there are no orbiting satellites, we've never gone into space with astronauts. And if we've not gone into space with astronauts, we've not landed on the moon. Already, this is pulling together a lot of really weird ideas. There are people out there who are geocentrists. They're, I've been battling them for years, too. But they believe that at least the Earth is spherical. They're just arguing about what goes around what. But they're taking that and bringing it into this flat Earth and adding, to, adding it to this. And there's also been, for about the past 15 years, this very vigorous uh, belief out there that the, we've not landed on the moon. And most of those people believe in a spherical Earth. Many of them believe we orbit the sun. Uh, so they're taking that disparate conspiracy and bringing this in. And uh, so actually what's going on here is they're grabbing all sorts of conspiracies and bringing them all together. It seems to be like the mother, mm -hmm. uh, mother load of all conspiracies brought together. So you have to believe in a huge amount of conspiracies. And... Uh, uh, this is um, uh, really starts coming down to to a uh, uh, sort of like the Matrix, you know the Matrix movies. You, uh, nothing is Not real. Yeah, you know, everything er, the reality doesn't exist as we know it. The reality of the world is very different from what we think it is, and I think yeah. that's exactly what's going on here. And some flat earthers, and by the way, I don't mean when I say flat earther, I don't mean that as a pejorative term that many people use. Uh, Eric Debay uses the term flat earthers himself to describe himself. So I'm simply using his term because apparently he doesn't find it offensive, and I'm not using it again in a pejorative sense. Like some people sometimes, oh, you're just a bunch of flat earthers, you creationists, and mm -hmm. people like that. So again, when I use the term flat earther, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. All right, there are a number of uh, flat earth arguments to put forward, and I would kind of break them down into one of several categories. Uh, one, one category would be simply uh, false information. And they present information that simply is not true. And I will try to give you at least one example of that today. Uh, sometimes they give you information that may be uh, true, but it's incomplete. Uh, you, there's more to tell in all of this. So if you, if you, if you have just incomplete information, uh, that again, not exactly false information, but it it's leads in the wrong direction because you don't have everything you need to know. Sometimes they take correct information and then they improperly interpret that information. I was watching a, a video recently on the, on the internet where this guy was going through videos of, of things and uh, he had right on his video information that showed the earth was spherical. Correct information, but then he interpreted that, led the, he was a narrator, he was leading the person, anybody watching it, down the path to think that this really proved a flat earth. I'm scratching my head on that, I'm trying to figure out. No, you've got the proof right there. You're, you're telling, you're saying it means something uh, different, a uh, different one it actually is. Sometimes they have assertions. Uh, they just simply assert something to be the case. I'll give an example of that a little later on. Now, uh, assertions may not be the same as the false information. They assert something. I don't know for a fact that, that this is not true, but they've not actually given any, any, any proof or evidence that it's true. They're just simply stating something is true without backing it up. So it could be false information. It might even be true information, but it is an assertion, and that is not a proper way to make your argument. And then sometimes they take unusual phenomenon, they take these unusual things, and I'll give you some examples of that later on, uh, that uh, they then pass off as being common. Uh, sometimes you can, you can see a phenomenon out there that if taken at face value, if it's a typical result, would indicate the Earth is flat. However, it's due to a rare, a rare set of circumstances, and you can't take rare circumstances and pass those off as the norm. And finally, there's an improper handling of Scripture. And I believe uh, I can give at least one example of that today. I, again, I could give several, give many, but uh, I just don't have the time. This is a, about an hour-long presentation. And there's a little presentation, a little, a little model somebody put up there, what they show the Earth to look like. And notice right away they've got the family values, flat Earth, globe of the Earth. All right? The family values, I don't know what that means. Family values, flat globe of the Earth there on the rim. What they did is they took a globe here, uh, the, the, the brass here that looked like brass, this ring here, and this other support over there. That's uh, clearly there once was a globe sitting there. I think they removed it, and then they made this flat Earth model and put it in there. And so what, what this is doing here, this, this part here, I don't know what that's, what good's that doing for you. It's, uh, clearly it was a modified globe. What they do is you'll notice what map they come up with. They uh, take a, a view of the Earth from above the North Pole. They believe the North Pole is the center of the Earth. And then you go up farther and farther, and you're getting farther away from the center of the Earth. And you'll notice distortions are there. South America, for instance, is quite large compared to North America. Never mind the fact that in actuality, the, uh, North America is quite large compared to South America. South America is the, 
Uh, third smallest continent, just barely larger than, than uh, Antarctica and Australia. And North America is the second largest, or third largest, it's behind Africa. But when you look at that, South America clearly is larger. And that's because of distortions as you get towards the polar regions or get to the hinter regions of any, any projection you do. And there's no way you can take a globe, uh, Earth, and put it on a flat Earth and not get distortions. You're, you learn that hopefully in, in fourth, I learned in fourth grade geography. We learned that quite a bit. You also notice how big Australia is. It's kind of stretched out. It's much, much bigger than Australia actually is. Asia's kind of dinky because it's up pretty far north near the pole. It's the largest continent by far, but it doesn't look that large mm -hmm. on this perspective. Notice at the edge of the Earth, there is the, what is called Antarctica. We would call it the continent, or I would call it the continent of Antarctica. To them, it's just this ring. They're a ring of an ice wall. <clears throat> and they say they don't know how far off the ice wall goes. And the dome comes down over top, and it, it lands somewhere, it rests just beyond that ice wall somewhere. It could be pretty far, it could be not too far, nobody knows. That is the, uh, the world as seen by the flat earthers, okay? Now, um, right away there's false history uh, coming across here. What is the false history? Well, I alluded to that already. The belief is that uh, nearly everybody thought the world was flat until five centuries ago. Remember that quote from... From Eric DeBay's book. He said that right after the, the wool comment, okay? And um, this is based upon the, the general understanding that most people seem to have, particularly in, in the United States, of the history of the world. Uh, they, most people, we all taught growing up there, but I thought the world was flat until the time of Columbus. Uh, I did. And it wasn't until I was in high school, the senior, junior or senior year, I, I found out that's not true. I figured out on my own. I read some sources that told me better than that. The general story we have is everybody thought the world was flat until 500 years ago when Christopher Columbus showed otherwise. And that's our common mythology that we have. And of course, this plays off when they start saying, well, everybody, you know, they changed the world 500 years ago. Well, that's not true. But even that's based upon an improper understanding of history. I said, supposedly, uh, Christopher Columbus showed that the world was round for the first time, or spherical. But if you stop and think about our little mythology, it doesn't make any sense. What did Columbus do? Well, he flew from Spain to the Caribbean, and uh, he did it four times. And each time he went to uh, the New World, he went back to Spain. And uh, so he went from Spain to the New World, back to Spain, then the New World, back to Spain, the New World, back to Spain, New World, back to Spain. He went back and forth four times. Uh, how did that prove the Earth is spherical? You know, our mythology we have doesn't even make any sense. Well, the uh, truth of the matter is, people have known for over 2,000 years, at least in the West they've known for over 2,000 years, that the Earth was spherical. At the time of Christopher Columbus, the question was not whether you could sail westward uh, from Europe to get to Asia, get to you know, India and China. Uh, that wasn't the question. Everybody agreed that you could. The question was, how far was it? The ships back then were very small. They, the deck sizes weren't much larger than the room we're in right now, by the way. It was just a small room. They were tiny ships. And they never sailed more than three days outside of land. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do what? You're going to take a voyage for six, nine months across this open ocean of tens of thousands of miles? I don't think so. It was a lot shorter and safer to head around the continent of Africa, whatever, head eastward to get there. And that was the big argument everybody had. Christopher Columbus thought otherwise, and he didn't know there were two continents sitting in the way. So our, our whole mythology of this started up in the 19th century, as it turns out, which we'll talk about later on on this. The flat earth movement, as it's called, by the way, there were people in the ancient world who did think the earth was flat, but in the West they got that rid of that 2,500 years ago. The uh, modern flat earth movement, though, started up in the 19th century. There was a man named Samuel Rowbottom. I love this name because it'll be obvious, uh, Rowbottom, it's kind of a play on words. I mean, Dickens would be proud of that particular name, as it turns out. And uh, he did a little experiment I'll talk about here, and he started writing this uh, book. It eventually was put together in a complete book called Synthetic Astronomy. It was published in 1864. He had written some things before, little pamphlets under a pseudonym, uh, Parallax. And this, that's the Zetetic Astronomy of the Earth, Not a Globe. And that seems to be the first uh, actual work on, on the Earth supposedly being flat. And uh, a guy named Carpenter picked up on this and wrote his own 100, 100 Proofs. And then Eric DeBay more recently has improved upon that. Well, I would teach this in my astronomy classes for the year, for when I taught at the university for years, and people kind of surprised. People knew the world was spherical thousands of years ago. How did they do that? Well, it's uh, pretty clear. Here is a photograph of a uh, lunar eclipse 
just starting here, and you can see that the Earth's shadow is impinging, and notice the shape that the Earth's shadow has. It's curved, isn't it? Obviously, the Earth's shadow is curved. It's part of a circle. There's another photograph of another lunar eclipse. It's a much deeper eclipse. And I've taken the liberty to, and draw utility in a PowerPoint mm -hmm. to put in a little dotted circle of the right shape, excuse me, the right size, I should say, in the right location. And you can see I've, I've outlined there the shape of the Earth's shadow, what we'll call the umbra. And uh, it's a bit bigger than the moon is, isn't it? And from this, you can see that the Earth's shadow is, 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 is circular. Now, is it possible that if the Earth were round and flat, that you could have a uh, shadow that's circular? Well, yeah, if the sunlight's coming straight down like this, you will cast a circular shadow. But what happens if the sun's rising? The sun's over here, and it hits the Earth. You're going to end up with kind of a line or an ellipse. It's not going to be circular, is it? And see, if you have an eclipse occurring at midnight, the light sun's down here, the light shines up, you're going to get a circular shadow. But if you have an eclipse, say, at sunrise or sunset, it's not going to be circular. Well, the ancient Greeks realized that, uh, that looking eclipse after eclipse after eclipse, and I've seen at least a dozen total lunar eclipses and a number of partials on top of that, and I can confirm it, no matter what time of night it is, early, middle, late, the Earth's shadow is always a circle. And the only shape that consistently casts a circular shadow is a sphere. That's a rigorous argument, actually. And it goes back, the first mention we know of goes back to Pythagoras in the 6th century BC. And very quickly, Greeks adopted this. Greek cosmology before that we think was basically flat, but after that it wasn't. Aristotle came by a couple of centuries after that, and he taught in his writings that the Earth was spherical. And Aristotle, by the way, was a, was a reference used uh, for the next 2,000 years in the West. Eratosthenes lived in the second century BC. He lived in Alexandria, northern Egypt, and he actually uh, did an experiment where he measured the circumference of the Earth pretty accurately. A lot of people are shocked to learn that. Eratosthenes was, by the way, the father of uh, geometry. Uh, excuse me, not geometry, geography. He coined that term because he was a, really into shape, and getting maps and so forth, and he worked at the great uh, uh, library in Alexandria. Uh, Ptolemy comes by in the second century AD, and he uh, recorded basically everything we know about uh, ancient astronomy. And he also had in there the Ptolemaic model, and he, you, you could use it to predict planetary positions and such. And it was all done with a, with a spherical Earth model. He knew the Earth was spherical. He gave reasons for that in his Almagest that he wrote. And some flat earthers try to argue that the Ptolemaic model was flat. And it's not. It's not a flat Earth model. They just repeat things that are not true in that particular case. And if you really want to learn more about this, there was a book written back in the 1991, Jeffrey Burton Russell. Uh, first part of the title is Inventing the Flat Earth. There's a subtitle of that, too. But it's a, not a very long book. But uh, Russell is a medieval scholar. And uh, he just got tired of people repeating this nonsense that in the Middle Ages everybody thought the world was flat. And he knew better than that. And so he wrote a book on the history of this and how this idea of flat earth uh, was what people believed in in ancient times. And, and he traced it, he proves, names names, he documents it. And the whole idea that everybody thought the world was flat, that was invented in the latter part of the 19th century, entirely in the 19th century, as it turns out. It's a big, fat lie that was promulgated in uh, the 19th century, amazingly enough. Huh. Uh, it uh, works that way. Well, actually, there are three important developments that took place in the 19th century. Uh, first of all, there was modern archaeology, as we know it came about, and one of the places they went was Mesopotamia, and uh, started digging up stuff there. People before that hadn't really had a systematized study of this, and when they, uh, when they, when they began to do that, they soon learned that they uncovered this particular description of a f domed, flat Earth cosmology. And this became known as the ancient Near Eastern, that's what A and E stands for, ancient Near Eastern cosmology. That is, this is the ancient Near Eastern cosmology. And that idea, well, it, it stood, held, held sway for more than a century. In fact, even today, many people, most people seem to think that. The problem is, there is no ancient Near Eastern cosmology. There are many ancient Near Eastern cosmologies, many different versions. And what happened is the first researchers on this dug one up, thought that that was it, and they just that became a set in stone. It was much later that people learned, 
wait a minute, this is just one. There were many, 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 many others, but it's stuck in our minds so much. In the recent years, people have attempted to correct the record, but it's very difficult. Second important uh, development was what we call the documentary hypothesis. This came out of uh, uh, higher criticism, the, uh, the liberals. They argued that the uh, Pentateuch was not written by Moses, but instead was written by four different sources. The JPED theory, these four different sources had different things they were trying to say, and uh, so they're disparate sources working on what became the, the, the Pentateuch, and pieces of them were stitched together rather late, maybe during the exile or shortly after the exile. So it was written well, centuries after Moses, if he even existed, died, and maybe even more than a thousand years after Moses, if he indeed existed. See, they didn't believe Moses is even real. And this documentary hypothesis, uh, they, they got the, the Gilgamesh epic became the flood legend in the Bible. And the creation story, that's all just A and E, creation myths that they brought in. And the cosmology they all also brought in. So the Old Testament incorporated this single flat earth domed uh, ancient Near Eastern cosmology. Well, again, there was no single A and E cosmology. Uh, there were many, many others. So this, this then compounds the idea, and the, and the people in the 19th century, such as Robottom, who started this flat earth business, they looked at this and they took it hook, line, and sinker. And I reject every bit of that. The third point is what developed called the conflict thesis. And the conflict thesis is this idea that came about in the, particularly the second half of the 19th century. Two men come forward to be uh, particularly responsible for this, Andrew Dixon White, and uh, John uh, uh, John Draper, uh, John Henry Draper, I believe, on the short. Anyway, they um, uh, they both uh, taught that they wrote books about this continual war between religion and uh, progress and science. Uh, read that as being Christianity and the Bible. And um, this conflict thesis was that uh, Christianity and, and, the, and, and progress were at war with each other. It wasn't until after the time of the, of the Enlightenment that people threw off the superstitions of Christianity, that the mind that could really run free, and man, oh, progress really took off at that point. And in order to do this, they had to do a real hatchet job in the Middle Ages, and so they called it the Dark Ages. You heard that call before? That came up in the latter 19th century. And Exhibit A, among the conflict thesis, was the idea that the Roman Catholic Church and Christianity in general throughout the Middle Ages taught that the earth was flat. And so this was their main point. And the point is, it was complete fabrication, a complete lie. In fact, this is where our mythology that everybody thought the world was flat to Columbus came about at that point. Uh, textbook study done, uh, the, uh, of textbooks done in 1880 uh, showed that most textbooks got the story of Columbus right. By 1890, almost none of them did. Mm -hmm. So that was a crucial decade during that time. So this whole thing is based on a complete fabrication. Now what got Robottom going, this is what, uh, what gets me into this funny, is he did a famous experiment in 1838. There was a place uh, called, uh, called the Bedford Level. In, uh, part near, in, in England. It's an area, it's a drainage area that uh, it's, I got a straight course for six miles and it was uh, virtually no, it's flat land entirely and the water is pretty flat. And so um, you've got this flat thing going here, but it's on a curvature earth, it's like this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look up this result, I had it proved to myself, I, I derived it mathematically, and it's true. If the Earth is spherical, and you're on a very smooth part of the Earth, like on the ocean or on the Bedford level, then in that first mile, the curvature of the Earth is eight inches. So, if you go out eight and uh, go out one mile, the Earth there is eight inches below where you're standing to start with. That's not much of a drop, is it? But that drop is eight inches, or two thirds of a foot, every mile squared. So after three miles, you take nine, because you square the three, multiply it by eight, and you get 72 inches. It's six feet. And then everything that squares and goes up very quickly. It's a quadratic, not a linear sort of mm -hmm. thing. It's kind of hard, hard to get your mind wrapped around that. So it, the, the curvature of the Earth is two, uh, eight, eight uh, inches per mile squared. And so he reasoned that if you had somebody on a small boat and they're They've got a, a mast, they put like a six foot mast on it, and they go the length of the, that Bedford level. Then, after three, if he, what he did is you can see on the far right, he placed a telescope uh, just eight inches above the water. And he reasoned if he's eight inches above the water, he can't see any farther than one mile. 
And if you get down uh, three miles beyond that, beyond uh, that point of one mile away, four miles now, the mast, the six foot mast will be below the horizon. You go the full six miles, it's like 12 feet below the horizon. So he reasoned if the earth is spherical, you can't see the mast once it goes out. And that's the reason I think the name is funny. His name was Rowbottom. And you got a guy rowing a boat in the bottom. So, I mean, I said, if you read Dickens, you have all these fantastic names he makes up. This is perfect. You can't make this up. That really was his name, Rowbottom. So the problem is he did not account for atmospheric refraction. I'm going to describe that for you just a minute, what that is, well understood uh, thing of physics. In fact, uh, there was much dispute about this. This started getting attention, started writing about it and getting a following. And, and so there was a, another man put up a, a challenge. He said, okay, anybody can come and prove that this is not a flat body of water. It's, it's actually curved. I'll give you this huge prize. Well, you've heard this fellow's name, Alfred Lord Wallace. And he came and he took up the challenge. Hmm. What he realized is if you did it at water level, you'd have atmospheric refraction. He rose up a number of feet and got out of that layer of air, and he showed actually the, the, the mass disappeared as you went over. Huh. Had to go to court to try to collect his money on that. <laughs> Long story there. Well, here's another one for you. This is one they liked. If you go on a, web, a website that's out there with a shilling for the flat earth, you'll see this quite a bit. This is a photograph. A photographer, by the way, the photographer who took this is not a flat earther. Uh, he's mortified, probably, that people are doing this. But he, uh, as a photographer, went over to the uh, western shore of Mich State of Michigan, on the east side of Lake Michigan. And under the right atmospheric conditions, a very clear sky, he took photographs of the uh, Chicago skyline. The skyline. You see the Willis Tower there, the John Hancock building, the Standard Oil building, all that sort of stuff showing up. And uh, the problem is, if you're taking it from 60 miles away, all of those buildings should be thousands of feet below the curvature of the Earth. So this proves the Earth is flat. And most people seeing this are thinking, whoa, what do you know? The Earth really is flat. That really gets people excited, doesn't it? Well, again, the photographer could do this almost any day, but he, he didn't. He only did it a couple, few times, actually. It's, not, it's a very rare event. It's one of those examples that, you know, a rare phenomenon being interpreted as everyday sort of thing. And uh, they say, well, they try to claim this is a mirage, and they say, but mirages are upside down. Well, one type of mirage will be upside down, but another type will not be, and this is the type we're talking about here. In fact, I'm not sure what that picture is of right there because it doesn't look right at all to me. There's uh, the mirage is, well, the inverted mirage should be an inferior mirage, and it ought to be lying below the yeah. ship, not above it, which makes no sense. I'm not saying this thing was faked, but there may have been some really unusual event that made that inset right there. So these people don't know what they're talking about, to be very blunt when they try to interpret this. Okay, what is this business about uh, air atmospheric uh, refraction? Well, normally air temperature decreases with altitude. You'll, you'll find that the air is warmest right at ground level, and as you ascend upward in altitude, the, uh, the temperature decreases. That's the normal things, the way things work. However, this is not the case during a temperature inversion. What I mean by that is you have a layer of air close to the ground, which is, is uh, cooler, and then a short distance above that, there's a layer that's warmer, and then above that, it starts dropping in temperature again. So up here, you may have some temp air that's the same temperature you have down at the ground layer. So you've got a real thin layer, usually with a strong interface there. It's uh, cool, as you rise up a few feet, bam, you hit this warmer air, and then it starts to decrease after that. And um, the, uh, that's, that's, again, that's a layer of cooler air along the surface with warmer air and then cooler air above that. And it turns out temperature inversions are very common over water, large bodies of water such as Lake Michigan or over the ocean. And these inversions are particularly common during late spring and into the summer, which is exactly when people will be paying attention. They don't pay attention other times of the year because it's too cold many times to do that. But in late winter and uh, spring and summer, it is pretty common. And what will happen in late spring and summer with a large body of water, such as inland seas, it's Great Lakes, or the ocean, is that um, the water is cooler because you're coming out of winter. The air is warming because you're going into spring and summer. And that uh, air heats up pretty quickly and cools off pretty quickly. So it's contact with something. It can't radiate away, but it can co contact. It's in contact with relatively cold water. And so usually in late spring and on into the summer, when it gets to be very warm, the layer of water, air right above the water can be quite cool. So you get this temperature inversion. Well, so what? Well, suppose you've got, a, 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 got the surface of the water sitting here. 
and you've got light traveling, traveling along almost parallel, but maybe kicking up just this very slight angle, it goes up like this. Now it encounters this, this warmer air above. Okay, so you've got this cool air here, the air light's coming up at a very grazing angle, hits this warmer layer, and you've got a problem. Because uh, you've got this angle of incidence coming in, and then you've got an angle of refraction. Well, this is a well-known understand, understand thing of optics. When That's how lenses work, how prisms work. When light hits that interface, it is bent at that point. And it's governed by what's called Snell's Law. If you've studied uh, physics, even general physics, you would have encountered this. And uh, it, uh, Snell's Law relates the angle of incidence to the angle of uh, transmission or the angle of refraction. And it depends upon the indices of refraction, which of the two media involved, the two layers of air in this case. And that critically depends upon the temperature of the air involved. Also the density, but the height difference is so minimal, it doesn't matter at that, can, uh, that point. If you have a temperature inversion, and only if you have a temperature inversion, for very low angles of incidence, there will be no real value for the angle of refraction. That is, if the light were to go into the warmer air above, it would give you some, if you tried punching the number on your calculator, it will give you an error because there is no angle to happen. And so the light is bent back down and reflects off that interface. It's called total internal reflection. If you have a a binoculars that have a a prisms inside, you're using to a couple of pairs of prisms to actually roll the image over and they have total internal reflection. Again, a well understood phenomenon. In this case, it's continually happening rather than happening just once. So you get this bending of the light around and around and around and around and around. Now, if the light is coming up fast enough, not grazing out, but it's steeper than that, it actually can transmit out only when it's coming at a very grazing angle. We're talking about an angle far less than one degree. So that light is trapped in that in that uh, cooler air below, and again, it's a very common phenomenon, as it turns out, the, the, the temperature inversion, and that light bends along the curvature of the Earth, and it can continue for miles and miles. Eventually, it gets scattered out, and it gets absorbed out by fog or whatever, things in the air. It's got to be very clear for this to go on and on and on. And we call this a superior image, because the, the skyline of Chicago is below the horizon, but you're seeing it up here. So whenever you see it above where it actually is, you're looking at what they call superior mirage at this point. And superior mirages, because they're above like this, actually are not inverted. They're right side up. So you can see that Chicago skyline, but only under very steady conditions with a large temperature inversion. Doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. Now, we can test this. Uh, If the flat earthers are correct on this, then this ought to be a common occurrence on a clear day. They're saying, okay, the Earth is flat, and that's the reason why you can see Chicago, uh, but you can't see if the Earth is curved. Ergo, the Earth is not curved, the Earth is flat. Done. they have proven the Earth flat Earth. And many people watching that, they think, whoa, that makes a lot of sense. Except I'm more skeptical, I know stuff, I'm, I, I'm a physicist, and I, and I understand refraction quite a bit, and that's, that's not an issue. Furthermore, um, if if they're right, if the Earth is flat, then you ought to be able to see around the curve to the Earth every clear day. I mean, so assuming you obviously see distant objects. So the Chicago skyline on a very clear day ought to be visible from the from the uh, eastern shore of Lake Michigan over over the state of Michigan every day that it's really clear. But the point is, it normally isn't because the Earth is spherical. You need that very unusual conditions to produce this. So it's taking a very strange uh, phenomenon and, and passing it off as normal. Well, I've tested this myself a couple of times. Back a number of years ago, I uh, went to Green Bay. Uh, there, uh, the Green Bay is not just a city. It's actually a bay. It's a little appendage of Lake Michigan with the Door County Peninsula in between. We were vacationing there. And I, uh, I'll tell you in a moment what, what I did there. The other one is a view from Lake Michigan. Uh, from the shoreline of Concordia University uh, in, in uh, Mequon, Wisconsin, just north of, uh, of Milwaukee. And this was just a couple of weeks ago that I did this. Let me show you a, a Landsat image of Lake Michigan. Oh, I forgot. There are no satellites, so this couldn't be taken from space. It must be faked. Well, anyway, I don't think they'd argue about this. You can see Lake Michigan. Down here is Chicago, right there, all this pink down there. And the picture they've taken from over here on this side, about 60 miles away. Uh, let's see, Milwaukee appears to be about right there, I believe, and so Mequon's up on the north side, 
And so across the lake here to Michigan is like 100 miles, maybe 110 miles max, but it's 100 miles over there. Up here is the uh, this green city of Green Bay is right here, and this is Green Bay right there, and this is the Door County Peninsula right there, the vacation spot. Up here, over here, this is this is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Wisconsin ends about right here, I think. So this is Upper Michigan. So we were over here uh, on this, and I took my son out here one morning out to a uh, to the beach there, it's a rocky beach, and we stood on the water, we looked across, I think people told me it's 18 miles, maybe 20, maybe more than 20 miles, very clear today, looked across to Michigan, but being over 20 miles away, the curvature of the earth carried it down, and I couldn't see anything, it was just open water as far as I could see. By the way, if, you're, if you stand normal height near the water's edge, you see it out to about six mi uh, six, uh, three miles, that's the, it drops down six feet, you're looking at six feet up, that's as far as you can mm -hmm. see. Well, got in the car, we drove around on the highway, and we went up, and there's some bluffs above the beach. I don't know how high they were, but noticeably higher than the beach was. And got up there, and we went to an overlook. My son and I looked off to the west, and guess what we saw? We saw the tree line in Upper Michigan. You can see the trees over there. It's plain as day. Because when you got up high enough, you could see over the curvature of the earth. Now, see, if the earth were flat from that bluff, I could see the, the shoreline of Upper Pen Peninsula of Michigan, the UP. But if the earth were flat, I could also see it from the beach. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see it from the beach. And that can only be if the earth is spherical. That's a very common phenomenon. People see that often enough. Now, let me get back to Mequon, just down here north of Milwaukee, looking across Lake Michigan there. Here's a photograph I took recently. As you can see, it's a pretty clear day. Mm -hmm. You can see out quite a range. And I'm on a bluff here. It's about 100 feet. And I can see out about 12 miles with that on a spherical earth. I went down to the beach. And I said that, you all remember the Quest Star Telescope I got out the other night? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we set it up down on the beach down there where that sidewalk is, and we looked out, and I scanned for almost the entire horizon from far as I could from one side to the other, and looked with the telescope at 50 and then 80 magnification, and I couldn't see anything. We brought it back up on top of the bluff here, and I looked out, and I couldn't see anything. All I could see was water and sky. That's all I could see. Now, if the Earth is spherical, I would expect that because the shoreline is like 100 miles away and I think anything on that shoreline is probably below the curvature. But if the Earth is flat, I should be able to see, particularly if I uh, see over to Michigan, even if, uh, particularly if I have a telescope, which I did. So anyway, Michigan, I'll take it 110 miles away. I think that's actually a little farther than it actually is, but I'll take it that. And uh, let's assume there's a tree canopy that's 45 feet tall. That's not really tall for a tree canopy. There's lots of forest over there. The canopy's probably much higher than that. But let's just lowball. I'm lowballing the height of the trees. I'm, uh, I'm highballing the distance. I want to be just as generous as I can on this. <laughs> so I ran the numbers, and the angle that the tops of the trees should make would be 16 arc seconds. Now, with the naked eye, you can't see that. You can see maybe a minute or two of arc, but not, a, not 16 arc seconds. There are 60 seconds in a, in a minute and 60 minutes in a degree. Well, this diameter is comparable to the diameter of the planet Saturn, the ball of Saturn. Do you remember looking at uh, Saturn through the telescope the other night? Could you see the disk of the planet pretty well? It was a cinch, wasn't it? So if I can see something the size of Saturn, and the tree line in Michigan ought to be about the size of that ball of Saturn. I should be able to see it from that point, shouldn't I? Up on the bluff, particularly. I didn't. Again, if the Earth were flat, I should be able to see that. But the Earth, I believe, is spherical, which my results of my two experiments I've described to you here agree with the Earth being spherical. They disprove the flat Earth. So when you when you get contradictory results like this, one saying it's flat, one saying it's not flat. Uh, what do you do? Well, you have to really weigh these things and look at the considerations, and I consider refraction, and uh, it's, a, it's an issue. And uh, again, it should be an everyday occurrence if the Earth is flat that you can see across it, but we don't. So the cluster easily could, could see that, and I saw nothing on the horizon. But I can take this test a bit further. You know, last November, I happened to be at Virginia Beach. So I went out to Virginia Beach. We weren't too, the place we were staying wasn't too far from the actual beach. So I went out there, and I took the Quest Star with me again. I put a camera on the thing. Now, I picked this very carefully uh, because it was in November, and a cold front had moved through. And that day, the temperature, when I started in the uh, mid-afternoon, early mid-afternoon, the temperature was 50 degrees. By the time I finished, it was in the upper 40s. The temperature was going down. I looked it up. The water temperature at Virginia Beach was in the low 60s, I think 62 to 64 degrees. Mm -hmm. 
So, do I have a temperature inversion going on here? No, I don't. What I have is very warm water, very cool air above, and so the layer of air right in contact with the, uh, with the water is going to be probably close to 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. You go up a few feet, a little distance, and it's going to drop down to 50, and then as you go higher, it's going to drop once again. So what I have is I have a, uh, drop, drop some more, I should say, I have highest temperature on the bottom, Going upward, I find the temperature drops pretty quickly at first, and more gradually after that, there is no temperature inversion. There can't be a temperature inversion. Again, I did this in autumn, as the water is cooling down. Most people aren't going out there on a cool day in autumn because it's just not real comfortable to do that. But in late spring and summer when it's warm, you're going to do that, and you're going to have a temperature inversion almost every day, guaranteed. So there's no temperature inversion, and I'm going to show you a series of photographs that I took. Here's one I took of a, of a ship that says NKY line on this. The Questar, by the way, has a 1,200 uh, millimeter focal length. That's a whale of a telephoto lens. So this is just straight to the camera. And what you can see there, as you can see, I think seven, seven uh, stacks of uh, layers of containers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know what this gray layer right there is. It's hard to say what that is. It looks like containers, but why do they have all one color there? It's something on the side of the yeah, ship, I think. I can see seven, a stack of seven containers that go down deeper than that, by the way. And then I see that level of gray, and then I see NKY line, it's on the hull of the ship, and notice the NKY line, it's below the, where the water is. Uh -huh. Now, they don't paint the name of their ship below the water line. <laughs> So already, I'm seeing part of the hole disappear. That's one of the proofs given for the flat Earth, for the spherical Earth, is that as the Earth is curved, the curve, as the ship travels away, the hole, hole of the ship ought to disappear. It's exactly what I'm seeing here. But let's go on. Let's go to the next photograph. Now this one, I got a little later in the day. Uh, the sun wasn't quite as bright, and I had to, I, I, I what, didn't have a right exposure time, so I had to up the exposure. So this one, it's a little dim from the last one, but I want you to notice something. Notice the NKY line doesn't show up so well anymore. That's because it's gone farther out. The ship is smaller. I can see almost all the ship now. And there's actually a, um, there is a, a, what we call an inferior mirage uh, taking place. And the inferior mirage is the kind of mirage you're used to seeing. In the summertime, we have warm pavement sitting here, or warm surface, flat. Uh, we've got sky up here. The sun's beating down, and it heats the ground, which heats a layer of air. You've got really warm air right there. So the sky, light from the sky comes down. It's coming in cooler air. It suddenly encounters this layer of very warm air. Remember before when the light couldn't make it up from out of the, out of the cooler into the warmer air? Well, the same thing's going on here. It can't make it into that, that uh, warmer air there. So instead of, go, instead of penetrating, it reflects off of it and it's a total internal reflection again. And since you're seeing blue sky, your mind interprets that as water sitting here reflecting the light of the sky. That's what causes an inferior mirage. And these things, uh, by the way, are inverted. What you're seeing there, you can't read the NK line too well because the surface of the water is about right here, and you're seeing an inferior mirage on top of the water. You're not even seeing the edge of the water there because you've got an inferior mirage walking all over it. Over here, you can see part of the forecastle of the container ship, a little thing peeking out on the end, and you're seeing an inferior mirage of it right there. So the water line, actually, is about right there. Everything you see below that level is actually an inferior mirage of what's above it. It's masking where the water line actually is. It took me a while to figure that out looking at it. Okay, I, I, what I did next is I changed the uh, exposure time because I was losing light, mm -hmm. and here, the hull is largely, you can't see the NKY line writing at all. The gray course of right here above the hull is starting to show up. And notice here, there is a reflection. That is the inferior mirage. You can see part of the white of the forecastle mm -hmm. reflected down here. So the water line is running on this level right there. You're only seeing now the top of the hull, a little bit of the top of the, uh, probably the N and the E right there is showing up. But the uh, but the, the lettering of the uh, NKY line, the major Japanese shipper, by the way, is below the horizon. Mm -hmm. This can't happen on a flat Earth, but it will happen on a spherical Earth. 
Next image, a little later on, now not only is the hull completely gone, but you're now starting to see the inferior mirage of some of those containers, and that's the multicolors mm. that they have. The holes completely disappear. Mm -hmm. On a spherical Earth, you expect the hole to disappear, and it did. But on flat Earth, the holes should still be visible. They say it's all a matter of perspective. If you magnify it, you'll see the holes hit a hole. No, you won't. I just show that you won't on this. Now notice what's going on <laughs> wow. here. Even more is reflected. Now you're starting to see part of the, of the bridge castle being reflected on this. And it goes even farther out. It's turned now. And actually, the water line is right here. Hmm. And what you're seeing here is a reflection of a big bunch of those containers. And I've got one more. Now the containers are invisible. All you see is the reflection. You see the top of the four, uh, bridge castle reflected upside down mm -hmm. beneath that. The water line is about right here, the horizon line. All of this down here is an inferior mirage. It looks like the thing's floating up there because it's cut off. So not only did the, the, the holes should disappear, but most of the containers have disappeared. This thing's out many miles. I have no idea how far it is, but it's moved way out. So again, this proves that the Earth is indeed spherical, not flat. I chose to do this experiment, though, on a day when, this, when there was no temperature inversion. The other people are doing it either unwittingly or intentionally. I don't know. Have you included those pictures in your articles? Yeah, they're online. If you can go and download them, they're on, the, on, the, on one of the articles I've written at Answers in Genesis, those photographs are, the question was, are those photographs in my article? They're there. Just go to, go to answersingenesis.org and just type flat earth and you'll get all my articles on there. Okay, how do they explain the lunar eclipses? You know, the, the shadow of the Earth is a circle, and uh, so consequently, they have to come up with a different explanation, don't they? And they point out that occasionally, it has, they, they, they don't say occasionally, they say, you know, there has been lunar eclipses with the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time. When I first read that, I thought, what? It's almost like, you know, here's the sun way up here, and the moon's over here way up, and it's in an eclipse. Now, if that were the case, then the conventional understanding of what a lunar eclipse is would be blown out of the water, wouldn't it? So when you hear this little factoid thrown out, there have been situations where the, where the, uh, the sun and the moon have both been in the sky during a lunar eclipse. That would, it would seem to most people, disprove that the Earth is spherical. However, with a little bit of reflection, it very quickly figured out what was going on. First of all, the sun and the moon are not point sources. They're about a half degree diameter. And the Earth's shadow is not a point. It's actually well more than a degree. All right? So uh, if you are seeing a, a lunar eclipse near sunrise or sunset, particularly if the lunar eclipse is beginning at sunset, then the sun can be right on the horizon here. And the Earth's shadow will be on the horizon, but it's going to stick up a little higher, a degree or so. And the moon is going to start pinching in it. You're going to do that. So you're going to see a little bit of the moon. Now, not going to last long. What's going to happen is the sun's going to set in a minute or two, and this is going to get a little higher. But for a moment or two, you can actually see both the sun in the west setting and the moon rising in the east partially eclipsed. Every eclipse, there's a big swath of the world, a narrow swath of the world, where the moon is rising at the beginning of the eclipse. And if you have excellent weather and you have a good exposure to both directions, you can actually see this. That's hard to pull off. My weather never cooperates that well. I've experienced this, but I know it can happen. Conversely, if it happens uh, at sunrise, the eclipse is ending, uh, you, can, you can actually see as the sun's rising in the east, the moon is uh, setting and stuff, you can see this, the moon emerging out of it. So on either side of sunrise and sunset, you can actually, if you have good exposure in great, the other direction of great weather, you can see both the sun and the moon, but only for a moment or two, and then it's over. So this idea that they're in the sky at the same time, that's not quite what they're implying it to be, and they pull out one occurrence that's been recorded in the past, or occasionally even today, and they pass that off as the norm. <laughs> So when I first encountered it, I had to think about, well, what, what's going on here? And I finally figured out what they're, in fact, they gave a date in the past when this supposedly happened like 200 years ago, and I looked it up and said, okay, now I know what's going on here. But, you know, in all this, this razzmatazz and obscuration, they've offered no alternate explanation. They're, they're pretty confident what doesn't cause a, a lunar eclipse, but they have no interest or curiosity as to why, what actually does cause it. And to me, that's very interesting. Okay, you, you, Mr. Smarty Pants, you told me what an eclipse is not. Tell me what it is. Well, I don't care. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I just know what it's not. And to me, that's fundamentally dishonest. 
It lacks a uh, mentally, intellectually dishonest, and it, and it shows a fundamental lack of, 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 of curiosity about the world. Well, how do flat earthers explain solar eclipses? Well, real simply, they don't. They simply assert that the conventional understanding is wrong. This is one of the assertions I told you about. In this case, it's a false assertion. And they also further argue that the moon is not really a, a sphere at all, but it's a disk, and it's a transparent disk. And they argue, they claim, to prove this, that you can see stars shining through the moon. And they give some arguments. Somebody 200 years ago claimed they saw a star shining through the moon. I saw another guy uh, on, on the Internet out there. He had a picture of the moon, and uh, he was doing it with some sort of video camera, movie camera, I think it was, looked like it. And you could see these stars inside the moon. Well, it didn't take me long to figure out what was going on. The guy had the game cranked way up, and what he was seeing was noise, hot pixels in the camera. <laughs> you know, he couldn't tell hot pixels. And the thing is, it would move with the moon. It would move with the camera, by the way. If it, if it was really stars, what would happen is the moon slowly moved. They would stay still, but they don't. So he didn't understand what he was using with his equipment. So there are all sorts of weird claims like this that are pretty easy to debunk if you happen to know a few things. But if you don't know much what's going on, you look at it and you're, oh, you're blown away and you have no idea how to explain that. Well, back uh, uh, back in, I think, uh, early December, there was an occultation of the star uh, Aldebaran. Uh, I, don't, I didn't have my telescope with me on the trip I was on, so I had to set up the camera and put the zoom on my lens and put it on a tripod. And you can see the moon there, and then to the upper left, there's a star up there. It's kind of blurry because uh, a little shutter in there. But that's the, the star... Uh, Aldebaran. It's one of the brightest, brighter stars in the sky, and one of the brightest stars that the moon occasionally occults. The moon passes in front of the star occasionally, and that night there happened to be, around 11 o'clock, there happened to be an occultation. I took this photograph a few minutes before 11, and you see the dark edge of the moon hasn't gotten to it yet. But a little later on, I took another photograph, and it's gone. It's gone. Now, it's one of the brighter stars in the sky. If the moon is just a, just a, just a transparent disk, then you should be able to see one of the brightest stars in the sky shining through it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. But you don't. So clearly, this is wrong. They just simply assert that the moon is a disk, and here's why, and they don't really give you good proof. They just assert that's the case. And I, as a person who's looked, looked at many occultations, I know that's patently false. You don't see stars through the moon, nor have you, could you ever see them through theirs. Mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they explain day and night? You know, on the Earth, it's a matter of the of the Earth rotating and the, and, the, and the Sun is carried below the uh, horizon. And what they claim is that each day the Earth, the Sun, spins around the North Pole like this. There's an axis right there at the North Pole on the flat Earth, and the Sun goes around. Well, if you're anywhere on the, on the globe, on the flat Earth, I should say, you could draw a line between your location and the location of the Sun. And so obviously the Sun will always be above the horizon. Well, but you don't understand, it's like a spotlight, there's a shield, a cutoff there, and it's just a cone of light coming down. And so when the sun is overhead, uh, over where you are, you're inside of that cone, you can see it's uh, daylight, and over here it's dark. The sun is above the horizon, but uh, you don't see it because you're outside of this cone that's got a shield upon the thing. Now, I find it remarkable that anybody believes this, anybody falls for this, because, again, you can... Uh, see that the sun doesn't actually set. Have you ever watched the sun set or rise? Yeah, it actually does sink below the horizon or seems to rise above the horizon. And so uh, if the history is correct, then the sun doesn't actually do either of those. It's always above the horizon. It just gets dimmer in the sky for some reason. Well, they claim it's a matter of, uh, doesn't actually, the sun doesn't actually rise or set. It's a matter of perspective. You see, when you go back here, if, it's, uh, if, if this thing moves from over here to over there, now it's lighting up another part of the world, then if you're over here, uh, the sun is so incredibly far away. See how far it is? It's over here, mm -hmm. as opposed to being high overhead. And so as it, things move away from you, they seem to get lower in the sky. It's a matter of perspective. Well, it gets lower in the sky, yeah, but still it's above the horizon. It doesn't sink. Uh, you can, your perspective can't buy you out of that one, if you really think about it at all. Furthermore, notice when you're right, when you're right here, if you're looking up, the sun is real close to you, and if over here, it's real far away, isn't it? So shouldn't the sun get, get smaller over here in the sky? Yeah, it should. In fact, there's several websites out there I've seen, the videos. They take a guy's got the sun, he's got the camera looking at the sun, and it's, it's time lapse. So the sun is this big glowing thing in the sky, and it gets lower in the sky, and it just kind of shrinks down to a small thing before it sets. What's going on there? Well, 
he doesn't change the exposure and you've got it grossly overexposed, it bleeds out into pixels all over the place and it gets lower in the sky, it gets fainter, it doesn't do that. So it looks like it sort of shrinks, doesn't it? And again, people may watch that and may not know any better, but I know better than this. Uh, so I decided to uh, I decided to test this. I did it last, last year, August 3rd. What I did is I went out at uh, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time out by Johnson Observatory at the, at the Creation Museum and I set up the Quest Star again with my camera and I took a photograph of the, of the sun. And the sun was eight degrees below the horizon. In fact, when I share the photo, you'll see that there, there's a little bit of tree branch in the way because I, I waited till 7.30 because before that the sun was below the trees. I couldn't get it any lower from our location. And I came back out at 1.45 uh, same day, and the sun was 63 degrees up, and that's as high as it got that time of day. You see where I live, uh, this time of year, local noon is about almost quarter to two. Local midnight is almost quarter to two, because uh, number one, we should be in the central time zone, where we keep Eastern Standard, and number two, we have uh, we have daylight stupid time going on. All right, so, so actually that's local noon. And that particular day, because the equation of time instead of being 139, it was 145. So I took this photograph when the sun was 63 degrees. Now, they claim that the, the moon, I took, I took the information from the, both the sun and the moon both are 32 miles across and are 3,000 feet up, I mean 3,000 miles up above the Earth's surface. I took that, came out right in Eric DeBay's book. I took that information, and I applied trigonometry to it. Remember I pointed out, if it's, over, it's noon, it's going to be high overhead. If it's late in the day, it's going to be way over here. So I, I applied trig to that well, well established mathematics. And I indicate, I found out that if this is true, then the sun ought to be 6.4 times larger when it's high up in the sky than when it's 63 degrees up than when it's 8 degrees up. Now, if the Earth is round and the sun is 93 million miles away, uh, almost a half million miles, almost a million miles across, uh, then there's not going to be noticeable differences there. So I've got a test here. If I take these two photographs and show you, then if, if they're the same size, then the Earth must be spherical, the Moon must, so it must be very far away. At least that's consistent with my prediction. Or if the Earth is flat, as I say, then it ought to be 6.4 times larger. Well, here are my images. The top one, by the way, the one the top is, is, is the first one. The reason why it's so red is I didn't change any of the settings. I had the same ISO. I believe it was 100 I thought it took. And the same exposure time. I have a solar filter on the telescope, but I, I didn't change the filter. I didn't change the ISO setting, and I didn't change the exposure time. I didn't want anybody to say, well, you just changed the exposure time. No, I didn't change any. It's the same exposure settings between the two of them. And the reason why it's so much redder and fainter there is because it's low in the sky. You know when the sun's low in the sky, it gets redder because of atmospheric extinction, it's called. So you can even see the tree branch right there on the up, lower right. There's a tree branch in the way of that one. Now you look at those. Are they the same size or not? Is the bottom one 6.4 times larger? <laughs> Slam dunk. The flat earth model cannot be true. I've tested their prediction, and their prediction falls completely <coughs> flat on this one. All right. Another claim is made. Uh, they claim that I, I encountered this from a guy last year emailing with him, and he asserted, once again, the North Star is visible well into the Southern Hemisphere. Now, the North Star lies close to the North Celestial Pole, and if you're right below the equator a degree or so with atmospheric refraction. So for right time of night, you can actually probably glimpse it, but more, farther than one degree south, you probably can't see it at all. And um, this guy was claiming that the, uh, that the, the, the uh, North Star was visible well south, uh, down like 20, 20 degrees, 25 degrees south of the equator. And I said, well, as an astronomer who's made 10 trips to the Southern Hemisphere and viewed it from several the sky from several countries on four different continents, I can tell you, no, the North Star is not visible from the Southern Hemisphere. What's your evidence? And he finally came up with a single page website, web page, ostensibly of a letter to the editor. No date was given. I think it was from the 1800s of people I never heard of quoting somebody else I never heard of that he could see the North Star. Now that's your level from, from the Southern Hemisphere. Now if that's your level of evidence, uh, then, then I can't help you. All right, You've got a living, breathing astronomer here who can give you very firm testimony, which I asked this person several times, what, what must you think of me? Either I'm grossly incompetent, don't know what I'm talking about, or I'm a big liar. Which one is it? He never would tell me. You know, I, that's really the two points you have in that case. He didn't want to insult me, but you know, you, you're insulting my intelligence and my veracity by, by this nonsense going on. Well, what happens is um, uh, they also assert that the uh, circular pattern that the stars, have you ever seen photographs like this that you open up a camera for an hour or so and you see these circular trails? They assert that that circular pattern can only be explained on a flat Earth. 
And I read this claim and I'm thinking, no, that's not true. It can't possibly. And I, I can prove that. This is what really goes on. This is our, remember I talked about the celestial sphere. This is the model we use. It's appropriate here. You got the earth there in the middle. You got the equator. You got the north pole. And you got the celestial equator there in the sky. The light pale blue circle out there is a celestial equator. Notice it's spinning around as indicated by the arrows. And up at the top there, above the north pole, it would be the north celestial pole. And the north star was, is, is within a degree of that. It's not exactly there, but close enough for our purposes. Now, actually, the Earth's axis is tilted a bit. And uh, in our case, it's not so much it's tilted as it is the fact that uh, we're on the Earth is important. I'm going to put my location uh, someplace on the Earth. But for a given location on the Earth, there, uh, my, my latitude is this angle phi right here. That angle phi, that's my latitude. tells you how far north of the equator I happen to be. This point over here is called the zenith. Over here is the north direction, and if you study, do the geometry here, this is the um, complement of that angle, and so this is the complement, this over here is the complement of the complement, so it must be, these two angles must be the same, that's basic geometry. This is my northern horizon, this is the north celestial pole, this is the angle then that the north star makes with the northern horizon. For me at the Creation Museum, it's 39 degrees roughly, it's my latitude. Where I used to live in South Carolina, it's 34 and a half, about 4 degrees Four, almost five degrees farther south, and I could see, I could see a change uh, between the two places because of the difference in in latitude on that. Obviously, if I'm below the the horizon, below the uh, the the equator in the southern hemisphere, this is going to lie below the northern horizon. It will not be visible. By the way, the stars, as the sky seems to spin around, will go in big circles because they're very far away. They'll go in big circles here in the northern part of the sky. So the spherical Earth actually will predict or should explain the fact that the stars seem to go in big circles around the North Celestial Pole. Okay, this is an image I took. It may not show up well here. That's the peak of my house right there, the front of my house. And I framed it up so the North Star is right there. The North Celestial Pole is about right here. Thank you. The North Celestial Pole is about right there. And the, uh, the, through the half hour exposure, the North Star has moved just a little bit. These other stars have moved quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Do you all see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And there are just countless photographs. You can go on the internet and see these, and you can notice that all of these are circles. Every one of them are circles. And on the spherical Earth, with the stars very far away as the Earth spins, you will get circles. So the people who claim that only on a flat Earth do you get this and not on a spherical Earth simply are not right. I can't be more emphatic about that. They're, they're wrong uh, about this. Now, what does their model say? Well, they say that we're on this flat Earth, and if there's the North Pole, remember it's the center of the flat Earth. And then over here is somebody's location. I put O for observer. And there's an angle phi here. It's not your latitude. That's just simply the angle that the North Celestial Pole, or the North Star here, makes with your northern horizon. And that angle depends not on your latitude, but it depends, well, I guess sort of does, depends on how far away you are from the center of the of the Earth and how tall this dome is. Let's suppose we take a star right here, okay? If I draw a line from point O up to that little red dot, there's going to be an angle between those two lines, wouldn't there be? Now, when this thing spins around, it's over here now. If I do another line, will those angles be the same? Can't be, because this is over here is farther away than that is. And again, one of my website articles, I do a little calculation. I show that the angle on one side is, is, is different from the other side. Now, this would be a, a circle on the celestial sphere up here, but we won't observe a circle. We will see a different shape. It will be a closed figure, but it will be uh, a little closer to the uh, North Star on one side and farther away on this, which means it doesn't have an equal radius, which means it's not a circle. It's a loop, but not a circle. And we agree that the pictures all show circles. In fact, the Flat Earthers claim that they're all circles. So their own model doesn't even agree with the, what they say that it's supposed to prove here. And also the rate at which this thing turns is different because it's going to be closer and farther away. If something's farther away, it seems to move more slowly if it's moving at a constant rate than if it's close to you. Ergo, it doesn't work because on the telescopes we have clock drives that turn at a constant rate, one revolution per day, and it couldn't keep track of things if that's the case. So if you know a little bit about astronomy, you'll realize these claims being made by the flat earthers are, are specious. 
Then we have uh, claims uh, made from Scripture. I'll just give you one. one. One example they like to give is from Daniel chapter 4. It's uh, Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. And uh, in this dream, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed that there was this great tree that grew up uh, out of the ground, and it grew to an exceedingly great height, and that tree was visible from all over the earth. The entire world could see this tree. And so the flat earthers say, wait a minute, how could a, a tree be visible from all over the world uh, on, a, on a spherical earth? No matter how tall the tree is, if you're on a spherical earth and the tree is up here, people out here can't see the tree because the earth is in the way. Again, no matter how tall the tree is on a spherical earth, you can't see to the top of the you can't see the tree from much of the earth. But on a flat earth, you could. So therefore, the Bible argues that the earth is flat. Well, it almost pains me to have to point this out, but <laughs> there are several problems here. The first and the most obvious is the fact that this is a dream. <laughs> Do you ever have dreams that are just a little out there? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember most of my dreams, but I'll wake up and I'll remember them, and then I'll forget them by the time I really get up. They don't stay with me very long. But, you know, I, I, all sorts of fantastic things. Things will happen. Things will move and change. You know, you're sitting over there uh, by, the, by, the, by, by your computer in the, in, the, in the room, and the next thing I know, you turn into my mother, and then you turn into a lion, and an elephant runs out the door and flies out the window. Also, and I just accept this. You know, this crazy stuff that you... And you all have dreams like that, right? I remember years ago, I was having a dream, and something so bizarre happened. This, uh, this is true. Something so bizarre happened in, the, in my dream that I just stopped and I protested. I said, this cannot be happening. This is impossible. I don't believe this. And then suddenly I, I realized, or maybe someone said to me, hey, you're dreaming. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Only time that ever happened to me. But dreams are just, you know, bizarro things. They're not supposed to be real anyway. So why in the world would you take a dream, particularly by what arguably is a pagan king? All right? You say, well, maybe he was born again because at the beginning of the dream he gives homage to the true God. Well, there are people who give homage to the true God who aren't born again people. Balaam did, and I don't think he was born again. Hmm. Furthermore, I think that homage was given after the whole thing that happened in chapter 4. As an introductory encapsulation, he gave, he gave praise to God because of what happened to him. Furthermore, it's, it's a dream which is not real. And furthermore, the dream has meaning. Daniel interprets the dream, and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. Well, which is it? Is it Nebuchadnezzar or is it a tree? Uh, you know, they're taking here what is clearly, clearly symbolic stuff, not even real stuff because it's in a dream, and trying to make it into real. And I think part of the problem is that there are people out there who say, okay, you, you creationists, do you think the, the, uh, the Bible is literally true? I'll show you literal! All right, that's what they're trying to do to us here, but I'll come back to that in just a minute. So they misuse scripture. It's just one example. All the others, they, they mess up too. Okay, you know when I ask my students about uh, about about the uh, about the uh, the, the uh, flat Earth, and the, the, how do you know the Earth is is a, is a ball? Most would say, well, you know, we got satellite photos from some space show the Earth is spherical. Well, yeah, we got those what in 1959 for the first time, 58 right after the space program started. But what did you do before that? We we didn't have things like that. We have astronauts too that go up there. And some of the astronauts who've gone into space are Christians, or later became Christians. You know where the two of the, two of the 12 men who walked on the moon later came to Christ? One was Charlie Duke, the other one's James, James Irwin. I contacted Charlie Duke, I have a contact with him, and I, and I asked him for some quotes, and you'll find his quotes on my, on my webpage, one of my articles there at the, at the website about this. And uh, we have a, a couple other astronauts. We had one come recently visit us. There's another one out there who's written a great book. These are two current astronauts, and uh, they've taken photographs in space. I can tell you, yeah, it's a, it's a ball. It's a sphere. So um, these, these Christians, Christian brothers, can testify that the Earth is spherical. In fact, I first encountered uh, people that doubted Apollo moon landings about 10 years ago, and I found what would shut them up pretty quickly. I said, well, you know, two of the men said they claimed to walk on the moon later became Christian brothers. And so when you accuse them of not uh, walking on the moon, the biggest thing that happened with their lives, ostensibly, you're accusing a Christian brother of, uh, of lying about that. And that usually would stop them in the tracks. One guy asked me that before, asked me about it before I gave a presentation. I said, we'll talk afterwards. That's what we think about this. He never came up afterwards. He said, I've never thought about that. <laughs> but I found a new breed now. When the flat earthers say this, they're unfazed. Their response is uh, that they're all Freemasons. <laughs> So hence they're part of the conspiracy. 
In fact, that gets thrown out a lot. This comes under the assertions. I don't know if all the astronauts are Freemasons. How do I go about proving that they are, or, or they aren't, I should say? It's impossible for me to prove that all the astronauts are not Freemasons. But it would be relatively easy for them to prove that many of them are. And they've never offered it. They simply say, oh, the Freemasons. And that gets repeated. It gets asserted. And so it becomes truth in the minds of people. If you really want to believe that assertion, then go ahead. But I think it's pretty lame. As far as I know, I've not been accused of being a Freemason yet. But because I think the flat earth, I know the flat earth is wrong, and I think the earth is spherical, I'm just waiting sometime for someone to accuse me for being a Freemason. By the way, for the record, out here, I am not a Freemason. I have never been a Freemason. I have no desire, never had a desire. I probably couldn't join because I couldn't keep my straight, a fa uh, a straight face during the whole thing. I've read about some of the, uh, the initiation stuff, and I would be snickering and giggling the whole time. I wouldn't like that. All right, so I am not a Freemason, folks. I really, I never, I never have been, never will be. All right. I just want to get it off my chest now in case somebody wants to, wants to accuse me. They're going to accuse me of lying now, I'm sure, if they see this, uh, this thing. Okay, what is the motivation of the Flat Earthers? I wish I knew. I, I think, uh, in fact, I know that many of these people that are doing this are undoubtedly well-intentioned. They, they tell me they're Christians, and, I, and I, I think they really are. They're sincere, but they've been sincerely misled in all of this. I am thoroughly convinced, however, some of those websites out there, they're doing this entirely as a prank. I, I think Eric DeBay may be pranking people on that. I think the thing, you know, the Flat Earth myth, uh, the, the, the title of one of his books, I, I think he's maybe toying with us even there. I think some of these people out there know exactly what they're doing, and they're just seeing if they can pull people in, and they're laughing themselves silly at our expense. And then I think there's a, a malicious streak as well. I think there are certain people out there who are attempting to make Christians look bad. As I said earlier, you, you creationists, you think the Bible's literally true? I'll show you literal. And I think they're trying to discredit us. And that's the reason why I think it's important is Genesis history. Well, you know, is everything in the Bible literally true? And the obvious answer is no. There's simile. There's metaphor. There's symbolic language, particularly in the prophetic passages and in the poetic passages. But Genesis night is neither. It's a historical narrative. That's why we know that it is the true account of what happened in the world. And you can't say, well, that it's just symbolic language. And, and this idea that we creationists think that the Bible is literally true, I've never thought the Bible is literally true in every word. It, it can't be because there are passages which clearly are not mean to be taken literally. That's, that's, the, that's the, the rub of it all. And I thank you very much for your attention today.